Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. How can an artist accurately paint his hometown from childhood memories? While another person forgets everything, even her name. Things are so mixed up. Why are some things so difficult to remember? While others seem impossible to forget. Remembering and forgetting. This time on Discovering Psychology. psychologists think that there's more than one type of memory is due to something called the serial position effect. Now you may have noticed the serial position effect for yourself when you try to memorize... If I'm going to profit when I learn here today, I'm going to have to remember it. The information, the sights, the sounds, and in some instances even the smells and textures. Somehow they have to be translated into codes that my brain can store and that I can retrieve when I need to. Images, ideas, language, and even my physical actions have to be represented in my memory and then retrieved to aid me when I need them. Memory is so essential, in fact, that to many psychologists and neuroscientists, it's the royal pathway for studying the functions of the mind and the structures of the brain. Experts estimate that the average human brain can store 100 trillion bits of information, yet we are capable of forgetting even the simplest of things. You ready? Research on forgetting makes us aware that memory is a complex psychological process, a dynamic one that's influenced by many factors. College, water, that's all I can remember. Mother. Do you think of her as married to your father? Mother. Mother. Do you think of her as married to Claudius? Mother. Mother. What was she like as a mother? Your memory can be affected by how much you concentrate and how much you rehearse. And it can also be affected by the context in which you learn something. What did we call what was left over? And the context in which you recall it. And it can be affected by your motivation as well. You can be motivated to remember or forget psychologically significant events which become blended in your memory with your wishes, fears, and fantasies. And finally, the state of your memory can be traced to your physical state and biological condition. And also, to interference from other events and experiences. No, I understand. Let me get back to you. I'm trying to get something done for later on this morning, okay? I'll, I'll get back to you. Okay, bye-bye. Modern research into memory began a little over a hundred years ago with a German psychologist named Hermann Ebbinghaus who studied the memorization of syllables in a seemingly meaningless series. By using them, Ebbinghaus hoped to obtain a pure, quantitative measure of memory, uncontaminated by previous learning. First, he learned a list of the syllables. Next, he tried to retain the list in his memory while distracting himself by learning other lists. Then he would test his memory by seeing how many times he had to reread the list before relearning it perfectly. As his original graph shows, the fewer times he had to go back to the list, the more information he had retained from his original effort. It turned out that Ebbinghaus's memories showed an initial rapid loss, followed by a gradually slower decline over the next month. Why did Ebbinghaus's memories fade so quickly, 
even with all of his training and practice. For starters, he had handicapped himself by attempting to get rid of the so-called complicating influence of meaning. He had no links, no hooks to use to tie the new input, the syllables, to already stored information. He had no context which could help him organize the unfamiliar in terms of the familiar. In getting rid of meaningful memories, Ebbinghaus unwittingly stripped himself of one of the most powerful strategies of the human mind, discovering meaning, order, and organization in the information it encounters. Decades of research followed in which many basic principles of memory were discovered using subjects who tried to recall nonsense syllables presented at precisely controlled intervals. Other researchers analyzed the memories of animals in learning mazes or making discriminations among possible choices. But this line of research was changed dramatically in the 60s with the advent of the computer. For the first time, psychologists could create a working model of the mechanisms of memory. This new approach depicted the mind as an information processor, like the computer. The information can be any knowledge received, processed, and understood by an individual. The complexity of memory could now be dissected into its component processes. First, input must be encoded, put into memory codes that can be registered by the brain. Then it must be stored and retained for some period of time, ranging from a moment to a lifetime. And finally, it must be retrieved on demand when it's needed. There are also two kinds of memory. Long-term memory is the storehouse of everything you know about the world and yourself, and is essentially unlimited. In theory, anything you have experienced which is stored in long-term memory is available for later recall. To understand the process of retrieval, try picturing your long-term memory as your own private library. But instead of information stored in books, some researchers believe it is stored and represented in the form of networks. In these associative networks, each piece of information or concept is linked to a family of others that share some common properties. Activating any of the concepts in the network activates the others associated with them. This activation process spreads automatically and rapidly, not only within networks, but also across to others that are linked in any way meaningful to the individual. In order for me to become consciously aware of the outcome of this activation process, in order for me to identify and understand what's going on around me, something more than long-term memory is needed. That's because long-term memory is like a passive storehouse of information and not an active information dispatcher. So we need a second memory system. We need a short-term memory. Short-term memory is the transient working memory that holds all the knowledge currently in use. All new information, those things we're paying attention to right now, must first pass through this narrow channel. And the information we retrieve from our long-term memory must also pass through here for inspection. But short-term memory has two major limitations. First, only a small amount of information can be held there. And second, the information can only be held for a short amount of time. It fades as soon as we shift our attention elsewhere. The new always pushes out the old. Still, our short-term working memory is an essential part of our psychological present. It links separate stimuli into episodes and then into stories as we engage in conversations, work, read, play, and just take in the world. Short-term memory does all this, yet it still cannot hold anything for more than about half a minute. And it can only store from five to nine items with an average of seven. So how can we get around these limitations of short-term memory? First, our memories can be held for a longer time if we rehearse the new information carefully without distractions. 
And second, more information can be held if we group items according to some pattern or something we're already familiar with. This is a process called chunking. A chunk can be a word, a meaningful phrase, or a number sequence. And seven chunks can have a lot more information in them than seven items. For instance, after I say the following sequence aloud, I want you to repeat it back to me number for number. Here goes. One, seven, seven, six, one, eight, one, two, one, eight, six, one, one, nine, one, four, one, nine, four, one. It's tough, isn't it? Now I wonder how well you do if I read the sequence this way. 1776, 1812, 1861, 1914, 1941. Instead of 20 numbers to remember, you have only five dates. Instead of 20 bits, five chunks of familiar information from American history. We learn new material by relating it, associating it to old material, to things that we already Gordon know. Bauer, a Stanford psychologist, specializes so in techniques which enhance memory, known as mnemonic sort of training techniques. Every memory problem can be broken down into several stages. Uh, one has to do with storing the material originally, that is, originally learning it when you're studying it. And the other stage has to do with being able to retrieve it at the time you're being tested and asked for recall. There are several techniques for improving one's memory, and one of these that's very effective is called the pig word, mnemonic. Mm -hmm. And here, the idea is to first learn a set of cues, or a set of reminders, pegs they're called, uh, which you will then use uh, to associate with things that you are to remember. Uh, so remember this, one is a bun, one is a bun, two is a shoe, two is a shoe, three is a tree, three is a tree, four is a door, four is a door, five is a beehive, five is a beehive. All right, these are the uh, items of unrelated words I'd like you to remember. Associate each item on the list with successive pegs. First, or number one, is lamp. Lamp. So associate that with bun. Bun. Lamp is heating the lamp is heating the bun right two is gloves two is uh, shoe the gloves are covering the shoe right number three is fire okay three is tree the tree is on fire right four is spoon four is door the spoon is opening the door five is ashtray five is beehive the ashtray is in front of the beehive Okay, very good. What was the third item in the list? Fire. The tree is on fire. I'd like you to go backwards through the list of items for me. Okay. Five, beehive, ashtray. Right. Four, door, spoon. Right. Three, tree, fire. Right. Two, shoe, glove, one, lamp, one,